We'd like to hear the ocean song again. Snap mountain trails that touch the wind. Cast your heart down long, winding country roads. We have probably one of the most beautiful days that I have seen in a long time um, up here um, in San Simeon at Hearst Castle. Um, we are actually standing on, let me go ahead and turn the camera around a little bit, just so you guys can all get a perspective of where we are. We're standing on the balcony of one of the guest cottages, and not just one of the guest cottages. This is the largest of the three cottages. This one is 5,300 square feet. This is Casa del Mar. This one is House of the Sea. Um, and speaking of the sea, and we want to make sure John gets his fix. How's about that for a view? Uh, it's I mean, beautiful. Oh, you know, we're going to go ahead and actually just take it in for a minute. So from this vantage point, you know, and I'm going to direct the camera so all of you guys can see, no. at probably about at least 15 miles of California coastline, starting up there, there's a little clump of rocks, big white rocks that are out there. Um, and that is uh, Piedras Blancas Lighthouse. And right below that is uh, the Elephant Seal Rookery, where we actually did a program last week looking at the, uh, the elephant seals and the largest rookery of elephant seals in the world. The Central Coast has a, um, a treasure trove, honestly, of, of offerings. And what I love is I love that through this distance learning, we are able to share the treasure trove that is the Central Coast with people from across the United States, well, and the world. But so you've seen up towards the elephant seal rookery, and now I'm kind of going all the way down the coast. It's such a clear day. That first little landmass that's jetting out right there, that's Cambria, and that's probably about 15 miles away. But then you see another uh, landmass that jets out even farther, and that's actually the southern tip um, of Estero Bay, of, of why this ranch captured the heart of William Hurst, captured the heart of one of the most uh, powerful, uh, diverse, complex, wealthy men of the 20th century. Yeah. yeah, so these are two gold statues. There's one here, and I'll show you the, another one in a moment. Um, this one is actually leaning over, she's bending, and in her hand, she actually is holding a frog. So this sculpture is of the girl getting ready to find her prince, is actually the last place that William Hurst uh, stayed in before he had to leave here for good. He would have stood on this balcony right here, looking at that view uh, for the last time in 1947. I'm surprised he didn't just have them build a hospital next door. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Considering how he literally moved mountains to make things happen, like building this house, I'm surprised too. He actually spent most of his time here in the third floor of what is known as Casa Grande. And let's just kind of pan around to give you all a perspective. You have a question or a comment about anything that I'm sharing with you. Uh, John kind of is able to see the, all of the audience members. And so if you raise your hand, he will be aware that you have a question and he will highlight your screen so that all of us can hear your question. It pleases us. So if you have a question and you wanna know the answer or you just have a comment, um, I would absolutely love to hear them. So please don't be shy and just, so here's our other friend, by the way. She's the one leaning over and smelling the rose. Um, and by the way, I can't wait to have an opportunity in a few months. Can you guys imagine how incredible our gardens are going to look oh. this year because <laughs> of all the rain? And one of my favorite things to do on a daily basis is to walk around and literally smell the roses. Um, so we will have our opportunity. But, you know, even these... The fountain, look at the detail of this fountain. You guys might be able to see the facial expression. I'm gonna get you a little bit closer. That's pretty oh, wow. Yeah. In 2017, to get to know this man better than people got to know him when he was alive.
And one of the things that he appreciated very much was art and the beauty of art and what art could share with us and um, specifically how, heart, how art allows us to experience times that have long been forgotten. Well, you know, with this shot. whole- That's a great shot there. Um, this whole home was designed with the intent of bringing us all back to the Renaissance. You know, five to 600 years ago, the Renaissance was literally, the word means a rebirth. He invited hundreds of guests to come up here and do exactly what we're doing today. The guests were not required to be here to entertain him. Uh, they actually were expected to be entertaining themselves. Beautiful stretch of coastline that hasn't been touched for 152 years. And, you know, 300 years ago, 500 years ago, this stretch of California coastline was not a part of the United States. It had been claimed by Spain. And uh, Spanish explorers during the Renaissance were sailing up the coast of California saying, hey, this is ours. So what a better place to recreate a Renaissance village, which is what his intent was. And there's a perfect example. There's our little Spanish Renaissance villa. What a better place to recreate that than on top of a mountain on the central coast of California that at one point had been part of Spain. Cottage, we're now looking at Casa del Sol, House of the Sun. This is the medium-sized guest cottage, and this cottage was approximately 3,500 square feet, but it was designed not just to incorporate Spanish Renaissance, but specifically Southern Spanish Renaissance. And you cannot talk about Southern Spain 500 years ago without talking about the influence that the Moorish people had on the art and the architecture of Southern Spain because they had been inhabiting Southern Spain for a very long time. And this look, this kind of blend of, of Moorish influence is actually called, it's a style of art called Mudahar, where you have a, a almost like an Islamic influence on um, on Spanish and Renaissance, Spanish Renaissance artwork. So that's why this balcony was incorporated and actually inside of that balcony is a little bathroom because inside the top of this tower is a little bedroom, tiny little bedroom. Uh, it's basically 82,000 acre ranch that covers about 250 square miles. What's the back view look like where you came from? Do a little 360 there just so we can get a feel get a perspective so we are walking on the esplanade the esplanade wraps all the way around the hilltop so these cottages are placed at a lower elevation and kind of in a semi-circular placement uh, surrounding Casa Grande or the main house which is where we're headed to um, a historic landmark and an art museum and you can see why here uh, we are casually walking by an 1800 year old sarcophagus that uh, in any other art museum probably wouldn't be sitting outside catching the light and the shadow of the sun but i love that we have an opportunity to see it like this because this is where william hurst placed it this is where he wanted his guests to experience it too was an avid art collector and he collected art, which has afforded us the opportunity to travel back in time to the Romans and find out what mattered to them. This sarcophagus, which is an ancient coffin, happens to have in the center Apollo with his griffin and his satyr. He was, a, uh, he was the god of the arts and music, so his attribute um, is a musical instrument. And he is surrounded by the muses, the muses of the arts. Some of them are holding masks because um, they are the muse of lyrical poetry or drama, comedy, history, astronomy. Um, so we get to learn a little bit more about ancient Roman uh, mythology simply by looking at this piece of art that William Hurst just happened to place out in his gardens. Can you get really close to that and do a, I can. a left to right, but really close? Let's start here. By the way, the woman with the helmet and the spear right there, 
that is Athena, uh, the goddess of wisdom and war. And so you can tell it's her by looking at her attributes. What does she carry with her? She carries a spear and a helmet because um, of the fact that she's the goddess of war. You got a ranger hat and a phone. What's that make you? I have no idea. That's a great question. Modern, I, I'm a modern day ranger, apparently. <laughs> that is so impressive. Wow. Is that marble? It is. Her hand is just resting on her chin and the, the incredible facial expressions. It's just pretty amazing what people were capable of creating. Um, would be very pleased to see how his art collection that he started to collect when he was 10 years old is still being studied and appreciated today. Let me set this tripod down for a minute to give you perspective. We are headed into the main house known as Casa Grande. Um, it looks like a church, as I mentioned earlier, because he wanted this to appear as if we were in a Spanish Renaissance village. And we, um, you in the comfort of your seat, me getting my exercise are going, where's my finger? There it is. We are gonna go all the way up and eventually make our way into the bell tower today. But specifically, that balcony that you're seeing right up here, that's the balcony of Marion Davies. Uh, that was her bedroom. Every night was right at sunset. They actually would come out here together and they would walk along the esplanade in the gardens, smelling the flowers. He wrote about a lot of these gardens. There's a lot of writings where he talks specifically about the wonderful smell of the Daphne plant, which just started blooming right now. Um, he was just asking, uh, who was this owned by? This was owned, this is the country home of William Randolph Hearst. Big home. I'm saying it's a big home. <laughs> yeah, it's a huge home. We're looking at a house right now that is 68,500 square feet. Second largest country home in the United States. There's 38 bedrooms in this house. There are 42 bathrooms. 38 people up here staying. He rarely ever filled every room in this house. So it does beg the question, why so many bedrooms if he doesn't have that many guests? And um, this is my assumption. So my idea is that there's over 22,000 pieces of art in this house in the rooms, in the hallways. And I honestly think that that man, William Hurst, had been collecting art his entire life. And he finally wanted to have a grand display case, uh, display case for his art collection. And I think in some ways the rooms might have been made more for the art than they were for the people who stayed in them. 1941, and on, I believe it was December 22nd, 1941, a Japanese submarine shot down an oil tanker right off the coast of Cambria, which is only about five miles south of here. So, and can you guys imagine soldiers swimming in the pool and just getting a nice break up here? Would have been a pretty amazing place to be invited to come up for dinner. And just give you a chance to take in this room. Uh, by far one of my most favorite rooms in this house. We are in the library. This library houses over 4,000 books. Uh, many of the books in this library are first edition books. Um, you have a ceiling that is about 500 years old from Italy. You have on the bookshelves ancient Greek vases. The vases up on the tops of these bookshelves, which I will give you a close-up of in just a minute. The vases in this room are anywhere from 2,300 years old to 2,800 years old. Wow. And they're displayed here casually on the bookshelves. Um, and what I think that he realized that by collecting ancient art, and even art from the Renaissance, he was capturing a time period. He was capturing stories from people that were no longer around to hear 
to tell their own story. And that's pretty interesting considering William Hurst was the owner of the largest media empire in the world. He understood the importance of a good story. And he surrounded himself and his guests with art that told good stories too. I'm going to raise you guys up really quick just so we can take a look. Oh my. That phone is quite a bit, that Verizon phone is quite a bit better than the other one. That's wow. really clear. I mean, it couldn't be any clearer. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I just Pretty. had the thought about how if he did a lot of his collecting, you know, before the war, he saved a lot of things from getting destroyed. Um, many of these pieces may have been destroyed had they remained in Europe during World War II. I wanna take a moment, I don't think I've ever shown you these up close, but we're talking about William Hearst, probably arguably the most famous newspaper man in the world. And here's an example of some of his newspapers. And let's go ahead and look at some of the um, some of the titles. I don't know if you guys can read that. 1939, from Poland to VE Day, 1945. So he was the man that was giving America the news. And no wonder he was such an influential person. His editorials, and by the way, what I've walked you into right now is his office. So this is where he would have been writing those editorials 70 years ago. That's a shot. Um, That's a shot. Pan yeah. to the right a little bit. There. Hold it. Perfect. Oh. Yeah, what an office, right? Oh, I got one just like it. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> One of the editorials that, um, that William Hurst wrote um, in this room, most likely, or another room just like it, was he wrote an editorial when his dog died. And his dog's name was Helen. It was a little dachshund. And Helen would follow him around wherever he went. And you know, just the visual of thinking of a little wiener dog following around a six foot four, 280 pound man. Um, is pretty humorous to me, but he was so distraught and so sad when Helen died that he wrote an over two page long editorial in his newspapers, published it in every single one of his papers, talking about the qualities that a dog brings to your life and how a dog really is your best friend. And it's a beautiful piece. And let me ask you this, does this man, does he look like somebody that's writing an editorial about dogs? Uh. Not really. That stare is what he was known for. His cold, calculating stare. This is William Hurst at the age of 31 years old. He's 31 years old when he's taking on the biggest names in journalism in New York City. He's going after Joseph Pulitzer. He's doing what Joseph Pulitzer was doing, but he was just doing it better. And he was not making a lot of friends in the process. Could you go close to one of the spines coming down on the side of the room there? Yeah. Because I noticed some detail that looked really interesting. Oh, they're beautiful. So all of these arches, first of all, just take a quick moment at the look of the arch. This arch is actually called a Gothic, kind of a Gothic style arch, the shape of it. But each one of these arches on the sides have Gothic fables painted on them. So different stories. And I'll try to get, let me get closer to the sun. Um, so you can see some of the detail. Oh, wow. But, you know, this was his idea. Like in this room, he was not sitting back idly and just waiting for Julia Morgan, his architect, to design everything. He was intimately involved in every aspect and design of this house. 
probably almost to a fault. Um, but he would tell her in detail what he wanted. And then she would somehow be able to interpret the ideas in his head and turn them into reality. On this arch, where's my finger? There it is. This is a Gothic fable right here. And my finger, uh, I'll take it away. But what you're seeing is there's an image of, looks like some girl in a bed and there's some wind and storm and then there's some man walking away. So that's a real Gothic fable. It's just been visually displayed here on these arches. And this was his idea. That's incredible. A man of many talents. And most people would not assume that he considered himself an architect's apprentice. And he actually even signed the telegrams that he sent to Julia Morgan, which, by the way, we have over 1,000 telegrams between the two of them. And he would sign his telegrams to that woman with the words, your architect's apprentice. Mm. He put himself beneath her. Just, uh, do a quick check with our communities and see if anybody has any questions or comments that they want to share. We have a question. Oh, something nice and lightweight to carry up those stairs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, walnut is not very easy. And you know, even thinking about that, um, you guys saw the stairs I was just walking up. Was that, was those, were those stairs wide enough to bring yeah. up a table like this? No. No. So that means that every single thing that is remotely large in this house actually had to be using kind of a pulley, a lift pulley system, had to be um, raised up and to the third or fourth level of the house and then brought in through the windows. The amount of ingenuity that went into this home and the amount of effort it took yeah. uh, to make what you're seeing today, um, it's hard to even fathom. It's yeah. hard to fathom how they accomplished this almost 100 years ago. Yeah. So we, we, we were wondering and trying to figure out if this is already a museum open to people or if it's just, you know, like, uh, if it's not yet a museum or if they hope to transition it into a museum. What is it exactly? That's a great question. Um, it, I'll just give you the, the, the briefest description possible. So from the 1920s through the 1940s, uh -huh. This was a private home. This was owned by William Randolph Hearst, and he invited many of his friends to come here and visit. So this was a vacation home. Uh, William Hearst died in 1951, and when he died, he told his family, he said, I do not want my dream house to be kept within the family. I want it to be shared with the public, and I'd like you to make this a museum. And so by 1958, the Hearst family donated this entire house and all of the art to oh, California great. State Parks. That's great. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And we are now, we have been a museum and we're coming up on our 70th year of being a museum. So uh, we give tours of this house every day. We're only closed three days out of the year. And on average, we share this home with anywhere between 800,000 and 1 million people every year. Every day. Wow. That's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. Pretty, it's pretty phenomenal. And I mean, what an incredible, generous gift. You know, you can imagine that this home and the art in this home is, is worth a lot. It's very valuable in many regards. And the fact that the family donated this to the state of California so it could be shared um, for, for future generations is, is, is a pretty incredible and generous gift. Wonderful gift. While I'm, we're waiting for more questions, I'm just gonna kind of show you a couple of things real quick. I love looking at the book titles. That's Randolph Hearst's uh, office that we just were in. Yes. So you would imagine that I would, I would think that because we're in his office that the books in here were maybe even a little bit more special to him. And I love the fact that that man must have read this book. Ah. The Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. Yep. And take a look at this. Oh, look at even this one. 
The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. <laughs> and how about this? This one makes me happy too. I don't know if you guys, can anyone read what this says? The blue one? Golden Book of Famous Women. Yeah. I don't know, um, I don't know how many multi-millionaire powerful American men were reading books about famous women in the 1930s. And the ones who had really excellent architects. Exactly, the ones that understood uh, what women were capable of. So the many sides of William Hurst. So his bedroom is on the same floor um, as his office. And this room appears really dark. And the reason it appears so dark um, partly is because of the lighting, but also because of the kind of the theme or the nature of this room. This whole floor is called the Gothic Suite, and it's based on art from the Gothic era. Um, so we've gone even farther back in time. We're now in the seven to 900 years ago range. Um, the Gothic era was dominated by art that was heavily religious in its themes um, because it was um, the church that was paying for most of the art. So it's not that William Hurst was a very religious man. It was that he was collecting art from a time period that was very religious. And I'm just going to slowly pan around to give you the full perspective. This is a two bedroom suite because there were two people staying up on this floor. There was William Hurst who slept in this room. And we will go in there in just a moment. And then there was Marion Davies, his companion, who slept in this room in this side. And I had mentioned earlier that she was with him for the last 30 years of his life. She is probably one of the most controversial parts of the story of this place and of William Hurst's life, but she is also one of the most important parts of his story, especially during the last 30 years of his life. The woman that stayed in that room was the only person that stepped up and came to his rescue when he was 75 years old and he was $80 million in debt and he was probably one of the least liked men in America. He was being made fun of openly, newspapers across the country. He was having to sell most of his art collection and he had to get rid of it fast. So he was selling his art collection in department stores um, across the United States. So imagine walking down um, a main busy street in New York City and finding one of William Hearst's little trinkets in the display case and people were laughing at that. And this is also the time period when Orson Welles was uh, writing Citizen Kane, which is loosely based on his life. Mm. And the only person that really stood up for him was her. Um, he apparently uh, used to, at the end of the night, so he worked in that office that we just were in, he would work in that office from about 12 midnight until 5.30 in the morning and he would go to bed around 5.30 in the morning, but apparently he would stop by this door on his way home, on his way to bed, and he would slip a little love poem underneath the door so that Mary and Davies could wake up in the morning and read one of his little love poems. Mm -hmm. And she kept copies of these poems, and she wrote about these poems in her own memoirs um, called The Times We Had. But one of the memories, one of the poems that she wrote said, um, that he wrote, excuse me, for her, um, said, no beauty is so fair a sight as the girl who lies by my side at night. And I don't know about you, but the man that I just showed you a portrait of in the office, mm. the man with that cold stare, um, it's not a man that most people assumed was writing poetry for his girlfriend that was 34 years younger than him. We're gonna make a quick stop into his bedroom. It's actually a pretty long bed. It's about seven feet long. It looks shorter um, because he was a big guy. He was six foot four, almost six foot four. 
and we'll just kind of take you on a quick little spin. You know, our bedrooms are where we keep some of our personal items. I'd like to quickly read this to you. It says, a description of La Cuesta Encantada, which is what this place was called, the Enchanted Hill. So a description of La Cuesta Encantada, the California home of Mr. Hurst. And it says, so this was not written specifically about Hearst, the Enchanted Hill, but it's a poem by Sir Edward Bulwer-Lytton that came from the Lady of Lyons. And somebody printed this out for him because they thought that it described this place. And it says, if thou wouldest have me paint the home to which could love fulfill its prayers, this hand would lead thee, listen, a palace lifting to eternal summer, its marble walls from out a glossy bower of coolest foliage, musical with birds. And when night came, the perfumed light stole through the mist of alabaster lamps and every air was heavy with the sighs of orange groves and music from sweet lutes and murmurs of low fountains that gushed forth. In the mist of roses, dost thou like the picture? But Phoebe Apperson Hurst was such a huge influence on his life. And maybe the reason why he had such a respect for women so much that he invited a female architect to build his dream house was because of the influence that this woman had on him as a young child. And what a perfect example to show the dichotomy. Mother, into art, wants to make her son refined. Father, minor, rough, used to want to be in his minds instead of being at home having tea with dignitaries eventually becomes a United States Senator representing California, dies in office. How do you please both? Who is this man right here? This is the, the man that he would spend time, he would spend time with George Hurst on this ranch. Right, okay. Yeah. So even if he was a rough and tumble, I mean, he still was giving his son the grace of nature. Yeah, exactly. Um, and his, his, so George Hurst bought the land here, not just because of the beauty, but he, uh, was actually hoping to mine cinnabar, uh, from the hills here, you know, because George Hurst was a miner. Um, and so this was, yes, one, to capture the beauty of the ranch and to raise horses, but two, because he was, you know, from a utilitarian standpoint, he was hoping to mine these hills. That's part of the reason that he bought the land. And speaking of the view, we'll give you one more little glimpse of the view from out William Hurst patio. And I bet you he stood out here. Uh, oh my. There yeah. we go. Oh. So um, with that, as we close the curtain, <laughs> that was awesome. I don't know how I did that. My videography skills are getting better. <laughs> um, let me turn the camera around one more time. And I would love uh, an opportunity to, did you all, en did you enjoy your tour? Very much. I'm really glad to hear that. And thank you for, um, for welcoming our our new friends, um, you know, it would be really nice to continue to get to do programs where we all be we're all together. Um, and I would love to share um, wherever our next program leads us. We're going to do it together, and we'll we'll capture whatever it is you want to see and talk about whatever parts of the story you want to hear about. So, thank you very much for uh, for coming along, Zoe. As always. <laughs> Um, I love to see you. And then let's see. Oh, heart back. heart back. Oh, thank you, Michael, very much. Yep. Let me see who else we have. Oh, wait, my screen's black. Well, everybody, thank you so much. Um, today was a beautiful day of, of seeing why this place was loved so much and why it's still loved today. And I wish you a wonderful Wednesday um, in the sunshine, if you're lucky and you have it. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. <laughs> there you are. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.